Okay, hi everyone. Google Plus tells me I'm live on the Hangout now. This is uh, episode five of the Technology for Good Hangout. Uh, thank you all for joining. Uh, episode five, uh, we have a lot of stories to get through today. Um, Abesh, who was on the show last week with me, can't join the show today, but uh, Mr. Chris Adams, uh, also known as at Mr. Chris Adams on Twitter, will be joining us shortly. Uh, as I say, we have a lot of stories to get through today. Uh, I'm using a slightly different technology to uh, display the screens today, so it might look a little different than normal. Uh, hopefully, it'll be okay, though. So, uh, straight in we go, and let's see if I can share this screen here. And um, boom, 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 boom. where's it gone? As I said, slightly different technology. Screen share. There we go. Hopefully, you can all see that, no problem. Uh, so the first story that I wanted to mention today is this story which comes from the San Diego Scripps Oceanographic, Oceanographic Institute. Uh, and as, as, as always, uh, the links for all these uh, will be in the, um, in the recording of the show. Uh, they're also on the event page. I put them up before starting the show this week for a change. I managed to get a little bit better organized. So if you're viewing this live on the events page, you have the um, links there for you. Uh, if not, if you're viewing it in the recording, the links will be in the uh, recording description on YouTube. So from the uh, Scripps Institute of Oceanography from UC San Diego, we're seeing news that satellite data reveals the rapid darkening of the Arctic. I understand I understand that this isn't really a tech story, a tech for good story, but I always want to start off setting a bit of context for the stories. And the, the big thing that comes out of this, I have it highlighted here, is based on the results, according to this study, based on the results, the albedo, and albedo is the reflectiveness given off by um, uh, by the snow and ice in the Arctic regions. Uh, and the reduction in that reflectance as the ice becomes less is having a negative effect on the climate. And in fact, uh, according to the researchers, the averaged over the entire globe, the loss of reflectivity is contributing one-fourth as large an effect as the CO2 that we've put into the atmosphere during the same period. So it's a quarter as powerful a climate changing uh, um, issue as the injection of CO2 into the atmosphere. So something that we're only now be becoming aware of, that this loss of ice, that it's having such a big effect on our climate. And we're seeing that uh, this story out of the BBC uh, during the week says that this winter was the wettest winter on record, according to the UK Met Office. And you saw uh, both in the UK and in Ireland uh, horrific storms tearing through the, the countries uh, over the last uh, couple of weeks and months. Uh, the, uh, the, uh, the previous record for rainfall was set in, uh, I think, uh, when was it? It was was it 94 uh, at 489. Uh, they've gone through that, and it's now about 500 millimeters. And there's still a couple of weeks left to go in winter. So uh, it's it's by far and away the wettest winter on record in the UK. So uh, things are changing, and not necessarily for the better. So onto some actual stories. Um, so the first thing I wanted to bring about was um, the uh, smart grid interoperability panel. Now, uh, I, did this you might not be aware of the smart grid interoperability panel. Uh, they're kind of low key. Uh, I hadn't come across much about them uh, myself, and I do a lot of work in this space. But I talked to um, the uh, um, what's his name? The direct, the executive director of the Smart Grid Interoperability Panel, Mr. Patrick Gannon, during the week, and we had a discussion about the Smart Grid Interoperability Panel. He brought me up to speed on the work it's doing. They have about 50 working groups, and they're doing things like agreeing standards for smart grids, uh, particularly throughout the U.S. But a lot of this work would be taken up elsewhere as well. 
because th those standards will work in other in other regions as well. Uh, but there's standards for things like uh, bringing renewables, bringing energy from renewables and distributed distribution onto the grid, incorporating storage onto grids, increasing reliability for grids. So it, it's great to see that this is happening. And the big standards body in the US is NIST, N-I-S-T. And I asked, uh, I asked Patrick in the call with him, what was the relationship between NIST and the SGIP? And he said that there, the SGIP was set up with um, uh, funding from NIST, and now uh, NIST are um, uh, no longer funding it, but are still heavily involved in it. So there's a good relationship between the two organizations there. OK. Um, the next story, uh, the five utility industry trends to watch this year. Uh, this was a, a, a post I saw on GigaOM during the week. And uh, it's, uh, it's an interesting story. There's a couple of things they talk about in the utility space that may be important this year. Uh, they talk about energy efficiency policies uh, continuing to spread worldwide. Natural gas and renewable energy uh, keep chipping away at coal. Uh, innovative utilities exploring ways to thrive in a distributed generation world. You know, kind of stuff you'd, you'd, you'd guess. Uh, a critical mass of smart meter infrastructure is paving the way for dynamic pricing programs. Well, we'll see about that. And lastly, demand response will aid the grid's transition towards renewable energy supply. And that's fair enough. I'm not sure that'll happen this year, but certainly demand response is paving the way. It'll happen at different spaces in different geos. The one thing that is missing from this five uh, that I was surprised about is there's no real mention of storage. And to my mind, uh, storage is going to Pay, play an increasingly large role in utilities and smart grids and the incorporation of renewables. Uh, the storage technologies are getting better and cheaper all the time, and they're a great way for the variable providers, uh, the winds and the solars in particular, to store energy when they're producing uh, a lot and then to reduce the amount of energy uh, that they are storing, uh, or sorry, to produce energy uh, from the storage and push that into the grid when they're not actually generating. So uh, more, more in the utilities and uh, renewable space was news that came from uh, GreenBiz, where they talk about the annual census of US solar jobs, and that as of 2013, the industry now employs about 143,000 Americans. Uh, the headline says the U.S. solar industry employs more than coal and gas combined. And they say that that's uh, an increase of nearly 20% from 2012. Uh, and with the addition of 23,600 solar jobs, employment grew 10 times the rate of national average, uh, uh, which was 1.9%. So fantastic news there. And that's just the solar industry. Um, jobs in the fossil fuel declined by 8.7%, 8, 8 shedding 8,500 positions, according to the Bureau of Labor Statistics. So really, we're seeing lots of jobs being uh, created by renewables. Um, so anyone tries to tell you that renewables are not creating jobs, uh, they're, they're talking rubbish. And you can point them at this particular report. There are links in the report to the annual census of U.S. solar jobs, for example, uh, and uh, solar jobs, a uh, report on that from Sustainable Business as well. More news from uh, the renewables area and Hyundai have announced that their Hyundai heavy arm have installed uh, Korea's largest offshore wind turbine. So they've installed a five and a half megawatt offshore wind turbine uh, off an island in South Korea. And it's one of several that they're going to be uh, rolling out eventually. Uh, they not only plan to supply three more, they say, uh, but also they have plans to uh, uh, um, install several overseas as well, including in Asia and Europe. So it's great to see that more companies coming into the space. Uh, Hyundai have already put up about 100 megawatts globally of wind turbines, uh, but and this is a big addition. So they're now bidding using the technology from this on other contracts around the world. 
Morocco is investing 11 billion in clean energy, that's 11 billion dollars in clean energy, in solar and wind energy projects. Uh, they want to turn um, Rabat into an uh, they want to turn Rabat from an importer uh, into an exporter of alternative energy by 2020 by building five solar energy stations. So that'll be an incredible turnaround in a very short space of time. Uh, 2020, we're now in 2014, so that gives six years to get from, from where they are now to being a net exporter of alternative energy. Uh, Moving on from there, Google is backing a study on the economic benefits of solar lamps. Solar lamps are being distributed at the moment uh, through a UK charity called Solar Aid in Africa to help alleviate poverty. And it, it seems to be doing uh, extremely well, he helping, for example, businesses stay open later, uh, helping uh, kids do their homework at night time. Uh, without having to use kerosene lamps, and kerosene lamps obviously not good in that A, they produce, uh, or A, they, 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 they burn fossil fuels, and B, they produce uh, noxious fumes. So they're, they're polluting. So now uh, these solar lamps are being distributed, but no one's measuring how well they're actually doing and what they're doing, whether they are actually helping. So now Google is uh, funding a study which will see whether or not these solar lamps are able to um, help out. So uh, the, the study it will, will create four different groups to study, uh, including a control group, and they'll be able to see that way uh, what's the best way to distribute these lamps. Should they give them out free? Should they uh, give them a low-cost loan? Uh, or what other kind of uh, policies should they implement when rolling these out? So. That'll be an interesting one to follow. Still in the energy space, slightly different story coming from the US, and scientists have say that they ha their, their giant laser has, for the first time, produced fusion energy. And this is a massive breakthrough uh, with potentially huge implications. It comes out of the Lawrence Livermore National Laboratory, uh, and they have, for the first time, produced significant amounts of fusion by zapping a target, a uh, target full of hydrogen, and zapping it to make it fuse to form helium. Uh, and, and by doing that with a huge laser, they've managed to, be, to produce energy. Now, the energy they've produced is more than the energy they put in, but it's not more than the energy that they used. So this, they're still not energy positive, but they have managed to produce fusion and to get some energy out. So it's taken them a long time, uh, and uh, for a long time it seems that they weren't going to get anywhere, but they had a, a recent breakthrough, and it's been written up in the journal Nature, uh, and they finally figured out how to squeeze the fuel with the lasers and form the, and get the fusion. So a big step forward there, and it seems now that fusion looking a little more likely than it did uh, up until recently. That, that has massive potential implications if they manage to get it right. And another story in the, in the energy space, uh, a teenager uh, called Du Wan Kuang, who is still in a high school in the US, has, he's, he's already a published author and he's published a paper outlining a new way of um, fueling cars to make them non-polluting. Excuse me, drinking a bit of water there. Uh, and his, his article, Combating Climate Change um, with Ammonia-Fueled Vehicles, he talks, in, he talks about using ammonia as a solution for fueling cars as opposed to ethanol. And the reason he, he says that that would be better is uh, he says ammonia is affordable and the tailpipe emissions from ammonia would consist of nitrogen and water as opposed to CO2, which sounds fair enough. There are infrastructure issues there and cars would need to be uh, 
not retrofitted, but they need to have some work done on them so that they could run entirely on ammonia at a cost of somewhere between a thousand and five thousand dollars per vehicle. So I'm not sure how how viable this is, but it's still it's an interesting idea, and maybe someone might be able to take that and run with it. Staying staying in the transportation space. Um, Tesla has confirmed uh, that they're going to ship 35,000 of their Model S cars this year uh, and that they're going to build a huge battery factory. They're calling the battery factory their gigafactory and they're going to, they're going to uh, create it with the help of partners. And as a result of that, they're hoping to, as I say, ship, uh, in increase their shipment of cars by about 55% this year to output 35,000 cars, uh, many of which they hope to ship then to Europe and Asia, uh, which has been underserved by Tesla to date. Toyota are talking about uh, wireless charging for their cars, and they have an article about it here. It's on the Triple Pundit site. Again, links in the show notes. So the idea here is that you'll be able to drive into your driveway and maybe back up to a wireless charging station. Uh, the car will have a way of guiding itself to park in so it parks properly. Um, the hope to <clears throat> ship cars with this technology in 2016, so it's, it's pretty imminent. And the, uh, the, the idea behind it is that it'll wirelessly charge the car, obviously, but the idea is not just that it'll wirelessly charge the car. The idea is that it'll make it more consumer friendly because the idea of having to get out of the car, uh, find the cable, plug it into a charger, uh, it, it's a little... You know, it's it's a couple of extra things that you have to do each evening when you come home. And if you know, if it's if it's horrendous, if it's you know, spilling rain or torrential or you know, nasty weather, you might be less inclined to do it. Whereas if you just have to back into your driveway, and that's it, if there's a, a wireless charger uh, installed there, then you know it becomes a far more attractive option. So there's a nice video here at the at the bottom of the piece uh, outlining the the um, the wireless charging. So take a look at that. Take a look at the video. See how it works. It's in Japanese, but you don't need the, you don't need to hear the text of it. You can see it it, it working. And read read the text of the article if you're interested. It's it's a good article. Speaking of wireless charging, uh, Dell have joined an alliance to bring wireless charging to laptops. So uh, the uh, Alliance for Wireless Power, it's called, have added Dell as one of its members. Uh, and they're coming together with another of the uh, wireless charging organizations as well uh, called PMA, the Power Matters Alliance. The two of them are coming together to create joint standards around wireless charging of laptops. So that's great as well. Anything we can do to get rid of wires is always a good thing. Uh, and it, you know, to, to stop having to haul chargers around the place would be good as well. So it, it's interesting to see the, the wireless charging happening both in the automobile space and also in the laptop space. Uh, and both of these things seem more imminent than, you know, more, more one to two years out than five to ten years out, which is good. Moving into the health space, and there's a great article on Wired this week about a woman uh, an American woman who has invented a way to run 30 lab tests on a single drop of blood. And the story uh, talks about this woman, Elizabeth Holmes, uh, who's now 30, uh, as it happens, but she started working on this uh, after leaving uh, school at the age of 19, and she's been working on it for the last 11 years. Uh, she's now got this uh, introduced into a Walgreens pharmacy in Palo Alto in California and the plan is to roll out these testing centers nationwide. So instead of having to get a vial of blood for every single test and then send them away and have them you know spend a week or two being tested and come back, the idea is that now with one drop of blood, so just a simple pinprick, you get the, you get the blood uh, leave it in Walgreens, come back in four or five hours, and you have you know those 30 different tests done. The site also lists 
its prices on its website, which is unusual, and the prices are about half the cost of the same price, or sorry, the same tests on Medicare or Medicaid, which would, they say, <clears throat> Uh, save Medicare 98 billion per year and Medicaid 104 billion per year, or, or sorry, not per year, save them 98 billion and 104 billion respectively over the next decade. There's a nice video there about it, how it works. And there's a Q&A with Elizabeth talking about her goals and starting the company, motivations, all that kind of thing, you know, it gets over fear of needles, it takes, it, it, you get rapid results. And one interesting uh, thing they talk about is how, <clears throat> excuse me, how when you send uh, cultures away to, you know, or, or uh, samples away to be cultured for bacteria or viruses, they can take days or weeks for the bacteria or viruses to grow. The, the um, strategy that uh, Theranos, which is the name of the company, takes is not to culture viruses or bacteria, but rather to do a DNA test for them. So if they do a DNA test for the pathogen, they, they can discover them much, much faster than actually trying to culture them. So it's a fascinating piece. I, I recommend you read it and see where technology is taking the health industry. More on the health industry, IBM are using their predictive analytics to detect patients at risk for heart failure. So predictive analytics is you know, where you look at uh, analytics, you look at data coming from somewhere and you try and predict forward. So IBM, have a, you know, they've been in the predictive analytics space for a while now, but now they've taken this and they've moved it into the healthcare space. And as I say, they're using it to try and predict people at risk of heart failure, which is fascinating. Similarly, not quite in the health space directly, but there's a great story in Grist talking about uh, a woman who has come up with a, uh, a British student, Emily Brooke, who has come up with a laser which can be fitted onto the front of uh, bicycles. The idea is that it projects <clears throat> an image of a bike, you know, about 10 meters in front of the cyclist, 16 feet it says in the article, in front of the cyclist, and you can see an image here, get rid of that popover, and one of the one of the points in the article is that apparently the majority of accidents with bikes happen not when the bike is going around the corner but when a bike is going straight at a junction and it's hit by a vehicle going around the corner that doesn't see it maybe the bike is in its blind spot often this happens with larger trucks so if it's projecting 16 feet ahead of it this big laser image of a bicycle that should alert the driver or at least make the driver far more aware that there is something on his or her inside and that they should then be more careful when taking that to turn. An interesting idea there. Uh, Apple, uh, Apple have come up with an interesting idea. Uh, they've patented a sensor packed health monitoring headphone set. So the idea being that uh, uh, we, we, we've talked in the show about wearables and uh, the possibility that Apple is going to introduce a smart watch. We talked about how they've been meeting with the FDA uh, to, to presumably get, um, uh, get agreement that they can launch uh, medical devices. Uh, and it looks now like they might actually be thinking of building some of the sensors for the medical devices into headphones that, you know, you see people wearing every day. Uh, the kinds of uh, Apple uh, earbuds that they, they sell. And these headphones, because they're in direct contact with the skin, uh, should be able to do things like measure heart rate, perspiration levels, temperature, and a variety of other metrics. So uh, it's, a, it's a fascinating idea. I've, I've no idea if it's going to come off, uh, but it seems like it, it, it's, it's a nice way of... Um, building sensors into something that people are often already wearing. They don't then need to go out and buy a watch, for example. I mean, if <clears throat> if they have a phone uh, uh, or a tablet or something that this could connect to uh, and an app, uh, it's already been uh, speculated that iOS 8 will have an app application built into the operating system. So it, it's looking more and more like the next version of iOS 8 will have a health application, and now that maybe these new earbuds will have the sensors built into them. So 
it's a fascinating uh, space, and, and it, it'll be interesting to see what comes out of that. Another story that I saw in this rough area, uh, kind of Internet of Things, wearables, kind of health space, is this one by Dan Tynan on the Yahoo Tech site. And it's how to keep an eye on your aging parents without annoying the crap out of them. And it's a story about a... Uh, a company called Lively, that's L-I-V-E exclamation mark Y, who have come up with a monitoring system, a kind of Internet of Things monitoring system for monitoring things like doors, keys, uh, pillboxes, fridges, those kinds of things with a simple um, series of sensors. So, you know, you attach one to the parent you want to monitor, you attach one to their key ring, uh, you attach one to their fridge, you attach one to their medicine cabinet, you have a central hub, <clears throat> and you get an app on your phone which allows you to monitor what's happening with these sensors, and you have a, a, a website as well that you can, again, see what's happening uh, with these sensors, and it gives you a, a, a breakdown of what's happening with your uh, relative all day, uh, how many times they've gone to the fridge, are they moving around, um, you know, uh, have they opened the door and gone out, have they come back. Uh, so the, these kinds of things are useful. They, what, they, what they don't have yet, according to the article, is they don't yet have, but they, they have plans to launch uh, a kind of a push-button alert system and uh, an accelerometer that if someone falls over, uh, an alert is sent. So they don't have that yet, but they're talking about having that later this year. So it seems like a nice kind of integrated system uh, which which has a nice combined um, <clears throat> website and uh, smartphone tablet app built into it. Um, is it. This is something that kind of resonates with me. My, my, my father lives alone in Ireland. Uh, so this is something I'm uh, very interested in, in looking at further uh, for that very reason. Uh, staying with the kind of wearables and Internet of Things space, Google have launched a series of recommendations for people who are wearing Google Glass. Google Glass is the uh, kind of we wearable computer that Google will be launching later this year. Uh, it's, it's possible if you get into the Google Explorers program that you can get uh, Google Glass now. It's kind of in beta at the moment. Uh, but they will be launching it later this year, apparently, and if they do, there's kind of a, a series of do's and don'ts based on kind of the, the last uh, year's trials that they've been doing. And it's it's, it's basic cultural stuff. Like, they, they, they say, don't be a glass hole. You know, take people's uh, consideration, feelings into consideration. Uh, don't uh, record people without their knowledge. You know, the usual kind of uh, basic manners. Okay, um... Moving on from that, the kind of whole Internet of Things space is uh, getting bigger and bigger, apparently. According to this article in Business Insider, and it's kind of a teaser article, you don't get the whole thing, but it's still interesting. <clears throat> They're talking about the number of everyday uh, and enterprise devices which will soon be connected to the Internet from everything from parking meters to home therm thermostats will be huge. They say... There's 1.9 billion devices today, and there will be 9 billion by 2018, according to the Business Insider estimates. Uh, so that's roughly equal to the number of smartphones, TVs, tablets, etc. combined. Basically, everyone is saying this area is exploding. And um, we've said that on this show uh, many times before, and I've pointed to things like the uh, Fitbit Force that I've got on my hand, which is connected to the internet. My... Canon 60 DSLR, which is connected to the internet. It connects over Wi-Fi. Um, I've got Philips Hue bulbs, and I'll talk about those in a second, which connect, <clears throat> um, you know, uh, uh, Belkin Wemos as well. All these kinds of things, all more and more connecting to the internet. So it, it's a space that is exploding at the moment, and I think 2014 is going to be a big year for it. Now, with that in mind... Uh, there was a review in the Independent uh, today. Uh, that's the UK Independent. It's uh, the URL is independent.co.uk, and the full uh, the full uh, link for this article, as I say, is in the in the show notes. There will be. 
So they, there's a big review of a device called Hive. Now, this, this is a UK-specific story, and Hive is a device that's being sold by British Gas for running thermostats. So it's kind of like a, uh, the, the, the UK equivalent of the Nest. Uh, it's for running thermostats. For uh, it, it's got a nice uh, website and smart app or smartphone app associated with it, as well as kind of a touch screen on the device itself. The review was written by a guy called David Crooks, who works for the Independent, and he starts off being very skeptical about Hive and uh, the fact that it comes from British Gas. You don't need to be a British Gas customer to have it installed. Uh, but it, 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 you know, it'll install and work with any thermostat. Um, so the cost of it is £199, uh, apparently. But by the end of the article, and he goes through the article in a lot of detail, by the end of the article, he's very positive about the outputs from the Hive and what it does for him, uh, allowing him to see his energy uh, and allowing him to save money on it. Uh, so it, it, it's it's... Uh, it, it's a nice piece if you are based in the UK particularly it might be worth taking a look at and seeing uh, whether or not you think the Hive would be good for you. Uh, next up is this story by Scott Jensen talking about the home automation paradox and this is an interesting one because it takes kind of a more skeptical view um, the, uh, of the Internet of Things and particularly of home automation. And uh, in the piece, um, uh, Scott talks about you know the the idea of it of, of home automation being what's called an easy hard problem. <clears throat> and what does he mean by that? So let's say you have your room programmed so that you walk into the room, the light goes on. Sounds reasonable enough, uh, but then he poses a number of problems. So let's say he says, I walk into the room and my wife is sleeping, therefore turning the lights wakes her up. And, you know, that's annoying, so that's something you don't want. And the solution to that, add more sensors, detect if someone is on the bed. Okay, so now walk into the room and my dog is sleeping on the bed, so the lights don't turn on. So better solution, or sorry, a solution to that, better, better sensors which can differentiate between humans and pets. Okay, so... I walk into the room, my wife is watching TV on the bed, she wants me to hand her a book, but as the room is dark, I can't see it. Solution? Read my mind. <laughs> so, as Scott, is, he says himself here in this, look, don't misunderstand my intentions here, I'm not being a Luddite. Uh, the problem is, it's an easy, hard problem, so it's not as easy as everyone makes out. We're very much at the uh, start of this. We're going to make lots of mistakes. Uh, eventually we'll get it right, but it's going to take a while and it's not going to, we're not going to get it right first time. So expect a lot of bumps in the road before we eventually get to the nirvana of home automation is the bottom line in this story. Um, <clears throat> there's another story by Stacey Higginbottom on the GigaOM site talking about smart plugs, the likes of the Belkin Wemo plug here in this, in this picture, and are they the gateway for the Internet of Things? She says her colleague Om Malik thinks so, and she links to an article where he does, uh, but she's, she's a bit more skeptical about it, and she makes a, good, a couple of good points about that. So it, 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 it's an interesting one. Uh, I'm a little um, uh, on the fence on this one as well, I can see advantages to smart plugs in certain situations, but frankly, I think having smart individual plugs is, is not the answer. I think what you need is a smart um, uh, junction box, a smart... You need all the devices in your home to be smart. You need to be able to control all of them, not just individual plugs. So your, your entire fuse box needs to be digital and smart and remotely controllable. That's where we need to get to eventually. Uh, is anyone proposing anything like that at the moment? Not that I've seen, but that's where we need to eventually get to. So speaking of Wemos and Belkin Wemos and <clears throat> smart devices, there was a, a hack 
of uh, Belkin's Wemo devices, and um, the uh, uh, they're, they're apparently now remotely controllable. I haven't heard yet if uh, Belkin have issued a fix to this, but it's something that raises uh, a couple of interesting points. If you're attaching your devices to the internet, you need to make sure just how secure they are. Obviously, if someone can control your light remotely and start switching it on and off, it's not that big a, a security issue, I guess. You know, more more annoying than anything else, and you know, you get over it by just unplugging the the the, the Wemo and just using a regular wall light light switch on the wall. But it does raise issues, and it's it's you know, there are certain situations where this could be risky. So again, until this is nailed down, uh, be aware that this is an issue. On the Green Monk site this week, I posted a review of the Philips Hue bulbs, which I've had for a while. And the um, conclusion I came to from having had the bulbs for a while is that they're pretty cool, I got to say. <clears throat> they allow you to do a couple of nice things like remotely control the bulbs, geofence them so you know they automatically go off or not or come on when you go out or uh, return home. Um, they allow you to set alarms and have kind of uh, simulated sunrises and sunsets such that the alarms come up to a particular brightness that you set on a particular day that you set or a series of days that you set and you can say that the, they come up to that brightness over a three minute period or over a nine minute period. So all, all very nice. The one uh, kind of thing that I said at the end though about these and it, it's not unique to Philips. This is a situation that uh, I haven't heard anyone else talk about, <clears throat> about the devices being connected in the home, but it, it's something I've noticed from looking at the Wemos and looking at the LifeX bulbs and looking now at the Philips bulbs in, in the last couple of uh, weeks. They're all consuming electricity when they're not producing light. And what do I mean by that? What I mean by that is because they're always connected, it means they're always listening to be remotely controlled, which means they're always consuming electricity. And this is, you know, not necessarily a good thing. The Philips ones are pretty good in terms of the electricity they consume. When they're uh, in listening mode, they consume just 0 0.4 watts, which is quite low. But that's 0 0.4 watts per bulb, plus they have a bridge which ships with them, and the bridge consumes uh, 1.6 watts. So three bulbs, which is what you get in a kit, <clears throat> three bulbs is 1.2 watts, plus the 1.6 of the bridge is 2.8 watts constant draw if you have the bulbs in listening mode all the time and the bridge turned on. There's a way around it, obviously, and that's turn the, uh, turn the lights off at the wall. If they're turned off the wall, then they consume zero, but then they're not listening and they're not remotely controllable. And then you're back to they're just being regular bulbs. As regular bulbs, they do really well. They, um, they, you know, they produce 600 candelas of light for about five watts, which is really impressive. Uh, it's a lot more impressive than the LifeX bulbs, for example, which produce a thousand uh, uh, candelas or a thousand lumens, um, but they take 18 watts to do that. So the, the Philips ones produce much better uh, watt, light per watt, uh, but you know, and, and, and they're, that's far, far better than incandescents or CFLs. So LED bulbs, definitely the way forward. But the whole Internet of Things and the home automation, um, yeah, it's, 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 it's it's an interesting one because if your home is if your devices in your home are constantly connecting or connected, it means they're constantly consuming electricity, and that can't be good for your overall electricity consumption. So it's 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 definitely one to think about. I'm not sure how or if we can get over that. There's 
I don't know. I, I honestly don't know. It's something that, that merits more discussion and more study. Absolutely it does. Moving on from there, uh, we're into the kind of miscellaneous stories at this stage. And in that, we see that Rackspace and Digital Realty have started building a highly efficient UK data center. Uh, I'm, I'll be talking to uh, someone from Rackspace the week after next, so I'll learn a little more about that. But it's a site covering 15 acres in the UK, and it'll offer four data center suites, so four data center rooms, and it'll uh, you know consume around 10 megawatts capacity. Uh, or sorry, it'll, it'll, uh, it's, it's expected to be completed at the start of 2015, providing six megawatts of capacity, sorry. The one thing uh, they talk about, I mean, they, they, they talk a lot about how they're using um, uh, open compute project uh, servers, um, which is great. So the power consumption will be kept low. They'll be talking, they'll be using uh, outside air to keep the facility cool, and that's very good as well. Uh, as long as it's not a hot summer's day. Um, one thing they don't say, though, is where they're sourcing their power from. I tried asking them on Twitter where they're sourcing their power from. I didn't get an answer. So I, I'll, I'll, I'll put it to Rackspace when I'm talking to them uh, in a couple of weeks' time and see what I can discover. Uh, I would like to hope that they're uh, getting renewable power. The UK grid is a mixed grid, though, so unless they're uh, producing directly on site, it'll be from the grid. So uh, we, we'll see how they respond to that one. In other news, um, Samsung uh, are bringing out their new Galaxy S5 uh, later this year. And the S5, it'll probably come next week, in fact, at the uh, Mobile World Conference in Barcelona. The S5 will have a fingerprint reader similar to the one on the iPhone 5S. So that'll be, that'll be interesting to see. And uh, they're talking about building in uh, applications which uh, can use the fingerprint sensor as a as a as a as a way to verify ID. So it looks like they'll be going a little further than Apple have done so far with the 5S fingerprint verification. Uh, IBM have set a new speed record for big data. Uh, currently, the, the the best can ship around 100 gigabytes per second. But they're now talking about uh, improving the internet backbone speeds uh, from that up to somewhere between two and 400 gigabits per second, which is really impressive. And why would you want to ship that much data? Well, they talk about the square kilometer array. The square kilometer array is a, a large telescope uh, which is um, basically a massive series of, I think it's something like 3,000 uh, radio telescopes, um, and they'll be in operation in Africa and Australia, uh, so, you know, across continents. Um, so they need to all be in communication with each other, and each of those would be outputting uh, petabytes of information. Uh, so for all of those to be at the same time creating petabytes of information and shipping that to a central compute resource, you know, having the ability to ship uh, 400 gigabytes per second will be extremely useful, you can imagine. Staying with IBM and Africa for the moment, uh, and this is the second last story today, uh, IBM are starting to roll out their Watson supercomputer in Africa. So they have a couple of use cases in this. They're, they've named this project Lucy. Uh, it'll take you know something like 10 years to roll it out fully and cost about 100 million. But they're talking about things like uh, helping uh, leapfrog the current infrastructure that's there and, and uh, several stages of development and do it for things like uh, logistics, traffic control, uh, weather, and those kinds of hard problems that something like Watson should be able to tackle reasonably quickly. So it's an interesting, an interesting story, and uh, good, good to see that being put to some good use. And lastly, uh, as we, we see Microsoft's uh, uh, general counsel, uh, Brad Smith, has been, uh, uh, has been honored by PBI. PBI are the pro bono institute in the US uh, for their approach to pro bono legal services. And this is a great article, talks about how, and not quite a tech article, but it's a tech company. 
and it talks about how the Pro Bono Institute have recognized the, the work that Microsoft and Brad Smith in particular have done uh, setting up this organization called KIND, uh, and that's an organization that helps kids in need of defense. KIND stands for Kids in Need of Defense. So they've done a massive amount of work. They're working with uh, often kids who come into the U.S. Uh, with, no, with no guardians. Uh, so uh, they're, they're helping kids with their immigration status and uh, security from abuse and persecution. So really interesting stuff there and fantastic to see Brad Smith and Microsoft A, getting involved in that and B, being honored for so doing. So that's it. That's all the uh, the news for today's show. Uh, thank you for taking the time out uh, to watch. And the uh, all, all the notes are on the, um, on the description of the event page, and they'll be on the Yahoo page as well when the show uh, appears in Yahoo in about 10, 15 minutes' time. It takes a while to process this, so it'll be on the Yahoo page. I'll also have it up on the uh, Green Monk site in the next couple of days, complete with all the links as well there. Thanks for taking the time, um, and we'll see you same bat time, same bat channel next week. Have a good one. Cheers.